Good afternoon guys, my name is Connie. If you're new here, you're welcome. So we're going to watch this video of Gaetan McKenzie. Gaetan McKenzie is a minister of arts, sports and culture. He's also a leader for a patriotic alliance party in South Africa. And his party, I think his party, looking at his the policy of their party, it's more center right party, center right party. So let's listening to him. He is going to come in and speak to the SABC News presenter. Let's listen. Sworn in as a minister in July this year, and he made numerous commitments, including a pledge to donate 100% of his parliamentary salary to the Jocelyn Smith Foundation for missing children and also fighting for equal pay for women and men in all sporting codes. So to talk to us about uh, the uh, first, ter first term in office and the first 100 plus days in office in the government of national unity, we are joined virtually now by Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture, Gaten McKenzie. Minister McKenzie, uh, good to have you with us. Welcome to Morning Live. Thank you, thank you, Sakina. It's always a pleasure being on the show. So it's uh, been a bit of a whirlwind, but how would you assess your first um, 100 plus days in office? Out of 10, I'll give myself 12. You know, I'm even like I've achieved so many things in those 100 days, and all because I'm surrounded by a very good team in the department. Mm. Come on, Gage, in 12, never give yourself a perfect score. There's always room for improvement, you know, you know? So, so let's break that down, giving yourself a 12 out of 10. Uh, what would you say you have achieved thus far? Right, let's start with the first thing, is that when I first became the minister, I was told that the National School of the Arts is closing down. They can't afford teacher salary. They can't afford to pay the electricity. Uh, it, that's Armageddon. I, it doesn't even fall directly under me. I didn't even say that. I just went straight and I sorted out the problem. Make sure we put them on the right track. Now the school is operating. 500 kids can still go to school. Uh, I then was told that there's no money to send the... You see? This is what, you, what I say when I talk about competency. This is what you see right now. What is saying, things that he's able to achieve for 90 days in office. How many years ANC has been in power? Things are, you know, are declining. There's, you know, there's huge Olympics, decline the in infrastructure, Olympics. everything. I immediately jump into action. Because they're looting. Well, it's what they're doing is to loot. They're not governing. They loot and they come around when it's election and throw out some T-shirts and go to the township and to get some vote and doing that. But they just you don't see them as much, just like you don't see them now. And there's a lot of problems you can see within those community townships, but you can't. You don't see them. You don't see them until it's late. Until now, they realize that people are angry, upset. You don't have to be doing that that's not necessary you need to be governing and put things in place right now the busy running around looking for this poison organophosphate poisoning but this organophosphate poisoning was there last year so if they had actually acted last year appropriately and monitoring these uh spaza shop and making sure people are there first of all are legal uh, they meet the migration act of south africa in terms of the amount they have if the migrant to be able to invest and be able to earn in those businesses those are small businesses you shouldn't ex you shouldn't actually expect a migrant running those businesses according to the south african migration act so all of those things the fact that they've ignore this stuff they've allowed this stuff and these people kept on bringing all these illegals bringing all these illegal goods illegal people illegal goods poisonous food and when you see that you don't act when you're supposed to act to enforce the law that's there the laws existed i was listening to yesterday to uh to the conference the department of agriculture person was there and and said very clearly as i said before that uh table force is scheduled so you shouldn't see any any table force in any supermarket for 
being sold. It's for license for agricultural reason when it's required for very highly trained. And people who are handling it are not going to be wearing normal clothes. They, they wear what I showed you, the people in white suit and all the mask because that thing, you don't want it anywhere in your skin. Even the clothing, the way they put it on, you, yeah. But you your environmental half South Africans have been going to the shops, have been seeing these chemicals sitting there. They have been asking questions, they've been questioning, they haven't even reporting into to the to the police. So you see? So if you're that's how ANC do it. Now they're busy doing that uh, because everybody can see it because everyone, this international media and everyone is on this thing, is on this saga, this problem. Okay, when you have problem and now they start acting like they, they're, they're going to do something. You should have, they should have done that quietly last year and deal with it then and then anticipate this would be a problem. In fact, we shouldn't be here. Even last year, we shouldn't have been there in last year, I would argue, because if they are governing, they would have actually anticipated this. They would have prevented this. They would have prevented the lawlessness of these people they brought into South Africa. They should have prevented it themselves by enforcing the law. But if you don't enforce the law, you've got element of looting and corruption. Um, like I said, it's either the incompetent or there's an element of an alleged corruption. There's the other two things that would allow this infiltration of illegal aliens into this puzzle shop industry. That is those two things. Incompetent or an element of corruption in it. Okay, let's listen in. This is Gating Mackenzie Gating. Perfect. This is an example. This is an ex Gating is, is an example of a leader who is strong, who is a center right in political view, and can deliver. This is the person you want in your community. This is the person you would want in any role because they have they can show what they've achieved. Not like talk and talk and. ANC every time, even that in that conference, I was listening to this business person. I was thinking they're talking about registration. I was like, it's something that you should have done all the time. You should have done the first time. The law was there. Why didn't you register these people? So why are you telling us now? You're breaking the law all this time, not registering these, uh, not vetting and doing the proper uh, stuff that you should have done before. Uh, what is that? What you know? It is they do this all the time. ANC people they do this, and it annoys me all the time. So I'm glad now to listen to somebody that I feel like you know at least they bring in something new, something you would expect in the boardroom. People bringing you the results, what they've done, what they'll be able to achieve, and the measurable outcome. You know, time bound. You know. Yeah, very smart. Gating is one person who can bring your smart goals. Specific, measurable, you know, and the goals are also relevant as well. A time bound. And you can be able to assess the outcome as well. It's just so a phenomenon. So let's listen well, to I've got two gold medals at the same championship in Peru. I have been told that a week before that the basketball under 18 African basketball championship had to be cancelled because nothing has really been organized by the South Africans. I jumped in with my whole team. Voila, we have one of the best uh, under 18 FIBA uh, basketball uh, championships. So I'm saying to you that I've achieved a lot, a lot in the thing together with the team that we are leading. And of course, uh, people have lauded you for that. And others, of course, expressing concern that wherever Minister McKenzie goes, he's making promises and commitments. And will he be able to keep to those? Uh, just last week, you promised uh, to campaign for equal pay for men and women across all sporting codes. So... What is the plan there? H how are you hoping to achieve that? Let me first start with the first part of your question about the promises. That's what politicians must do. You must tell people what you're going to do for them. So, I mean, you can't just do for people and not tell them, this is what I plan to do for you. Some plans I have people say, now that's not important. And then what I do, I then leave those plans. 
so of course I have to tell people what I'm going to do for them. You know, this thing where men and women in America, for instance, they are getting a right to pay men and women equal. You know, we should leave this thing where we always think that men's sport is the one that you pay people according to the income at the gate. The sponsorship, the all those things, they have nothing to do with gate takings. I think we must try to pay men and women equal. Uh, cricket has done a lot more than any other sport in the department so far. They are not where they should be, but they are strong on their way there. So you say, uh, you know, as a politician, you should be uh, telling people about your plans rather than empty yeah. promises. So if we talk, say, football, there's Banyana Banyana who are in action tonight. What is the plan to actually bring a salary parity for men and women in football? You know, let's take something that, you see, football is not totally in my hands, simply because uh, governments should never be seen to be totally interfering in the administration and the running of football. What you can do is, you know, we give SAFA money. We met with SAFA, for instance, we said, listen, we need you to qualify for the African Nations Cup. We need you to qualify for the uh, World Cup. We need you to host the FCON Women's uh, Nations Cup. And if they don't do that, we will stop giving them money. So in that department, what we are doing is we are motivating them to say, you will lose the grant that we give you if you don't perform that. But let's take something that's in my hands, like the F1. I made a promise that we are going to bring the F1 to South Africa. What have I done since I made that promise? I have met with the press, the CEO of, of, of F1, Mr. Stefano. I have met with the president of the FIA, which is the world governing body when it comes to motorsport. I've had meetings, I've got endorsements from the likes of, continued endorsements from the likes of Lewis Hamilton. We're getting an endorsement very soon from Verstappen. So we're having meetings, we are moving the needle. The same goes for uh, UFC that has never been to South Africa. We met with Dana White, the owner of UFC. We met with the management of UFC. They then came back and they said they are coming definitely to Africa. And some journalists asked South or North Africa. He said South Africa first. Now, for me, those are all efforts that I have brought since I came in, and I'm not going to stop. I want South Africa to be on all the world calendars of events. On the 20th of November, we're making a massive announcement, which I can't share now. But South, Africa, South Africans must know they've entrusted me in the sport and arts and culture department, and I want us to, to be the best in the world. You know, you, you can't just be like an obscure country not being part of the world calendar. So if I make a promise, I keep it. And the issue of the VAR that everybody's asking me about every day, uh, you know, they said VAR is expensive. But in my new budget, the new financial year, we're making provision to pay for, for VAR. So people should just give us until March, April, and then we will then give the money for the VAR because mm. we need it. Support. So that suggests that you've crunched the numbers on that. What will it cost to bring VAR? So you see... The idea that politicians shouldn't tell you why what they plan to do, that's the reason why South Africa is it's where it is right now. Politicians need to tell you. Politicians need to provide you a what they're going to do about your issues. You cannot just be always uh, voting for the struggle. How long are you going to be struggling for? You know, you're always in a struggle. You can't be voting for struggle. You're voting for success. And Gaten McKenzie is, is showing us how to vote for success. And he's laid out his plan for, um, for his department. And I would like the plan for the other department so we don't get a uh, shock. Just like we're getting shock from Dr. Neon Schreiber, Every time when he comes out, he's like, what the heck are you going on about? Why are you doing what, what are you doing? So we want to hear this uh, stuff that actually are there, that's, met, that's you know, it's going to help the community, especially the South African community, mostly, uh, you know, people in remote, in townships, and to play sports, have equal participation. It's a brilliant idea. He's such a great, you know, great uh, person, and he's, you know, he's showing them how it, how it's like, how to govern, how to govern. I mean, you gotta show people what are you gonna offer for them for their vote. 
and how what are you doing even if he doesn't succeed at least he's, he's telling us what he's been doing to in order to succeed to succeed in order to move the needle into that direction where he wants it to be because he's told us you cannot just enter any role without any smart goals. Smart goals are part of any profession to have those specific. Because if you generalize, if you listen to ANC, everything they talk about is generalized. I mean, you cannot, generalize is very dodgy because you cannot even measure. You cannot ask the person, you said you're going to do X, Y, Z, but you haven't, to, you know, so, but they're going on about the struggle. The struggle, when are you going to remain struggle? How you measure struggle? When are you going to reduce the struggle? When is the struggle go, going down? When is it going down, the struggle? You know, it is dumb. It's dumb. So I like Gaethje McKenzie. I think I think he's phenomenal in his role. And he should be number one, you know, minister. You know, he's great. I like him to the PSL and how much are you budgeting as a department for that, Minister? We are will cost us 70 million rands to bring to the PSL. PSL. It will cost us 70 million rands and it will cost us like 45,000 rands per game. So it's one of 70 million and 45,000 rands per game. We are hoping to budget 50% of that and get the remainder from sponsorship. It's important that you have VR, you know, you must move with the game, you know, with in the future, and not not now, but in the future, AI will will, will overtake VR. It will, will be part of VR in saying that they will decide, and not humans, if there was a, a, a fall or if that's a penalty, all those things. And I mean, if we are not even at VR stage, where the, the world is going to move on. So I'm saying that we've budgeted half of that money, 35 million rent for VAR. The rest will get from sponsorship. So by April, May next year, mm. we definitely pass a VAR. So, so what, also... why does the Department of Sport, Art and Culture have to do that? You've got the PSL. Um, one would imagine that uh, they are adequately funded. Um, you know, you've got SAFA who are there. You've got uh, continental bodies as well as uh, global bodies that are involved in football. Why would it then fall on your department to make sure that there's VAR in the PSL? What I've picked up, and this is that there's some sort of reluctance to from some of these uh, officials to install VAR in South Africa uh, for various reasons. But my thing is that we are the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture. We're here for the people. We have to listen to the voice of the people. Currently, the voice of the people is telling us, please intervene. We need VAR. We've been asking for it. It's not coming. Now, when you go to the officials and they say, we just, Safa says, we just don't have the money to do that. And Safa has done a lot of research in that. And then you come and you say, all right, we will meet you halfway. Meet us halfway because we ultimately serve the people and the demands of the people we cannot ignore. Mm. So VAR is coming. It's not a department. It's a very perfect statement that he said there is that ultimately we serve for the people. Even like to hear something like that. If you're a South Africa, do you don't you like to hear somebody tells you that they're actually working for you? You know, you are the employer. You've elected them to actually represent you, and they re they represent you with pride. I mean, Gaten McKenzie is such a phenomenal leader, and I think all of you people out there, you should actually observe. Try to emulate him, see how he does things, because it's all about what he does. It's not so much about what a person uh, say, but it's what they do. And Gaten McKenzie has shown to be a patriotic South African, um, no doubt about it, no doubt. And there's, uh, I was so upset in a couple of you know days when I saw these things. I was thinking, oh, why are these people, why I don't hear anything from him when these problems are happening? But I realized that he is constrained because he cannot be campaigning as the other party because DA is busy campaigning, but he needs to, he's a minister. So at least uh, he's um, 
or the deputy needs to be the one that's doing a lot of campaigning for PA because campaigning for things like the thing, problems that we're seeing right now around these you know, illegal migration and policy and asking questions that are specific towards these issues. Because if you don't do it, people are going to think you're fake, you know. So I don't know where Kenny Gunana where is he because we don't hear him as much because he's meant to be up there in the centre and asking these questions as a deputy to really be out there and, you know, standing out for PA and their motto, but this party, it is the centre-right party. They're so centred, and that's what we need. We do not need people who are dividing us and creating this chaos. We want the centre. People who can bring, some a leader who can bring all people of different background, different nationality, different views, and bring them all to the centre. It's all we're missing in our in South African political environment. Is we're missing the centre right party. I don't know. ANC was telling, has been saying they're centre left, but there's something. Uh, they might be centre left, but the way they, they they don't govern. The problem with ANC, they don't govern. They don't govern. They they really are full of corruption and looting, but they're not governing. That is the big problem. Fundamental intervention. It is FIFA. FIFA wants VAR, wants the members to, to have VAR, and I'm going to be in good books of FIFA if, if I'm not going to be seen as interference if I bring VAR. So, and, and I'm asking this because, you know, also in terms of uh, some of the promises, the commitments that you've made uh, since you've taken over this ministry, um, that they, they seem to come like that. Uh, you take the F1 uh, issue, for example. So as you say, and, and I listened to you carefully, you spoke about the continued endorsement by someone like Lewis Hamilton, which of course uh, speaks to the fact that this is not the first time that a minister in your portfolio has tried to bring F1 to South Africa. But there again, if you look at the cost, uh, what will it cost South Africa to put on a Formula One event vis-a-vis uh, who stands to benefit from that? You know, who will be involved in that? And if you weigh that up against the broader um, needs of South Africans, more broadly speaking, uh, we just listened to a viewer who said uh, they want to see uh, fields for children to play sport in the Northern Cape, for example. So, again... Are these vanity projects? Uh, as you say, you listen to what the people are saying, but which people, which South Africans would be able to afford to actually even go uh, to watch Formula One if it is brought to South Africa? All right. <clears throat> you see, you mustn't just look at how much it costs. You must also think at how much it brings. People always look at how much something costs. Number one, nobody said that government must pay for F1. That's the first thing. In Rwanda, for instance, they are building a track from scratch, which is government. In South Africa, we have Kalami, which is 80% there, and I'm told that the, the big announcement is being made tomorrow regarding uh, Kalami. Now, already a track would cost you something like uh, close to a billion rand, uh, if not more. And we're not building it as government. And secondly, let's look at a country like Hungary. Hungary had 350,000 people at the F1. Uh, 250,000 people came from outside. The normal F1, uh, the average F1 supporter or visitor doesn't stay in a two-star hotel. They stay four-star, five-star. They come here for more than five days to the country. I mean, do, do, that's jobs. That's tourism. Our country is being showcased. Now, everybody just talk about the price, but what does this to have 250,000 visitors to your country, to have 70 million people around, uh, 700 million people around the globe watching your country. That's an advert, you know, that's an advert that, that is really uh, something our country needs to have, to have uh, the people that will get jobs, the people that will come to this country, the people that will return after the thing, and we're going to get sports. Yeah, people get job, but you need to control this informal markets as infiltrated by illegal migrants. 
cannot bring people, say, to South Africans or illegal migrants, I mean, illegal or migrants who are there, who are working in informal sector, are skilled. They're not skilled. So, but it's not getting my, my Kansas role again. So if you control those entry, you can actually improve the South African lives because then they can enter this business and sell this stuff and be trying and benefit economically themselves for selling their country to the world. But you just first you need to limit this influx of illegal, unskilled people coming into South African markets, claiming to be asylum, claiming to be refugee. That is not Gaten's role, but that is also all linked to that, to those benefits that you you uh, you may have in the country. So it's uh, it's a good idea. However, with this porous border and everything and chemicals are being put in into the country, and that to this today we still don't know where these chemicals come from, whether they're intentionally being uh, put there to, to actually, you know, destroy the future of South Africans by killing the kids of South Africa. It's un we un this is just a question. It's not a fact. It's a question. It's a question mark, it's not a fact, it's a question. It's still unknown. So there is huge risk here of this country, my country. Obviously, I'm not living in South Africa, but I am expat South Africans. But you know, I am I think there's something that needs to be done about this porous border. There need to be a funding that is there to build that wall and strengthening everything that's required to ensure safety and security. You really have to focus on safety and security because it impacts on everything. It's impact even on visitors in tourism. You know, people don't want to come, they want to come to your country and feel safe. They don't want to come to your country and feel like they're going to be marked, they're going to be exposed to certain food. If they buy street food, they're not going to be sure the street food people have died, so therefore they have to be careful. There's a lot of things that in these negative events influence the country and the perception. And unfortunately, all of that it affects South Africans who are not doing these things, are people who are there being brought up by these human rights NGO people. Yeah, I, yeah. Anyway, let's listen and continue to listen. South Africa is, is rich in, in countries, in, in, sport, in, in, in companies that, that, that CEOs, that there's a lot for sport. A lot for that. certain sports, I'll say to you, Minister, because going back to the issue we spoke about, about um, a pay parity and the sponsorship in that regard, you're not seeing the same level of sponsorship across the board. You will have women's sport that are lagging behind, have been lagging behind, are still suffering, whereas everybody is jumping to support and sponsor the Springboks, uh, to support uh, the cricket team. You know, so those sort of things would suggest that government needs to interfere in a meaningful way that says uh, there, there must be rules in terms of what sponsors can, how much they sponsor where, uh, on what, so that you can spread that pie more evenly. And, and, and that's what we're not hearing. You know, to say that people sponsor, yes, they sponsor. They sponsor what they want. And this is why the picture remains very uneven, Minister. Do you have any sort of plans to intervene in that way uh, when it comes to the sponsorships? I think we must be totally transparent and honest when it comes to that. No sponsor around the world will sponsor a losing team. People want ROI. People want the return on investment. No sponsor in the, you know, sponsors in South Africa, corporate sponsors have been really, really done hard by. Because some of these federations never, they get money, they don't uh, account for the money that they got. They will send 20 uh, people overseas, uh, officials and 18 players. These are things that have happened in the past. You will have people buying cars with the money that they've been, that was used to, for at least sponsorship, for instance. And yep. A lot of corruption. So in terms of the sponsorship, really, I think the sponsorship is all about who is watching. 
Sponsorship will increase if you as a citizen, you are watching women's sports. If people are watching women's sports, if I have a product, I would like to go and advertise in that sports and have the players wearing my logo and it's good for my brand and people for my brand exposure. So I will sponsor it because I know the South African citizen would be watching that sports. But if the citizen aren't watching the sports, then that sponsor is going to earn a lot of money by sponsoring a team that they know that the, the citizen aren't going to be watching it. So, and also they know that, yeah, so it is an important thing, but we need also to be careful about realizing that we as consumer, we are responsible for if we don't support these women's sports, if we don't support anything, these uh, young uh, people, when they young, young some when they play and support and develop a culture of supporting what our own, then that's what you're going to see. Because as a sponsor, I mean, imagine if you're sponsor just sponsoring a team whereby you won't have any many people watching it. Uh, I mean, in a country, you want to put your product to be known in that country, but nobody's watching. You wouldn't want to sponsor any team that is not as popular, familiar. So it is so important why you, you, for you guys to gauge all this stuff because it's all influenced by business decision. And yeah, let's listen. And I'm saying that, yes, we still have a very long way to go. I plan, I've made this one of the big commitments I've made. You know, you look at Banyana Banyana, you know, we already have soccer women millionaires in Banyana Banyana. And I was pleasantly shocked and surprised when I was informed about that. And and, and, and we're not there yet where we should be, but we are not where we used to be. So mm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way, that's why I, uh, uh, when they qualified for the Cricket World Cup, I made sure that I don't watch from my house. I go to the stadium and I sit there, I send them messages. All the teams, I send Banyana Banyana messages. They going to go to the UK and play in Coventry City. I send the cricket, uh, spoke to the uh, women's cricket uh, team. What I'm saying is that the fact that it was a subject that's taboo prior to me uh, coming in. Now I'm bold in saying that we must treat women in sport better. And, and I'm not saying the sponsors and the corporates are all hundred um, percent. No, we still have issues there that we need to to sort out. Okay. And, and I can tell you, all right, we're getting there. Uh, I, I just uh, there's so many things that I want to touch on. So your views uh, yeah. on reports that uh, SA Rugby intends to uh, sell allegedly a twenty percent stake of the Springboks commercial rights uh, to a, a private equity company, Ackley Sports Group. Your thoughts on that particular deal? Well, you know, I've met the Eccles a few months ago. I have looked at the deal, and I told them first, uh, just looking at the structure of this deal before I go, I, I wouldn't agree with the deal in its current format. Well, how could you? There's no significance in this deal. I said to Saru, this is wrong. They then said, us give them 30 days. After 30 days, they came back. They assured me we now have significance in the deal. Now, there's a whole lot of noise uh, currently regarding the deal. I then got uh, um, letters from the federations, uh, the unions, asking me to intervene. Uh, can I please speak to Saru? I then wrote Saru a letter to postpone the vote for a yes or no of this deal. I asked them nicely. They responded in kind and said, we will do so, Minister. Uh, we will give you what you're asking us for. We have until, I think, the 6th of December, and then we're putting it again to a vote. But what I'm saying in the meantime, you can't say a deal is bad if you have nothing to compare it to. All these uh, billionaires and all these companies that's complaining about the deal, put another deal there. Put another deal, better than an equity deal. We will be... Yes, that's true. So it's all about the funds. As long as, like he said, this is a, a South African sport, so South Africa must be in that deal. deal. Well, if, if, if you just look at the Ackley deal, Minister McKenzie, if you look at what happened with uh, um, NZR and with the All Blacks, a few years ago, they sold a 6%, a 6% stake, and they were paid around $130 million. And now you compare the South African deal, where we're talking about a 20% stake, and uh, how much are they trying to pay us for that? 
Yeah, but here's the issue, 1.2 billion. But here's the issue. Then let's go back to what you're saying with the NZ deal. That money is just not coming from New Zealand, and people don't talk about that. New Zealand is waiting for the money. It's not flowing the way that we expected it to flow. Yes, you but, know, but that's a separate deal, right. minister. That's a separate issue, Minister. The fact no, of the matter is the my money that is being make. paid for a stake and comparing the size of the stake in that deal and this deal and the fact that we are getting paid less than you deal New Zealand was paid for a 60 percent, for sorry, for a 6 percent stake, surely that already raises questions. It did raise questions, the answer I wrote the letter. I'm not agreeing with the deal. I'm just saying that you have to compare to something locally. You know, if you look at the Springbok brand, That's we perfect. have the Springboks. But let's be honest, the New Zealand brand is bigger in the world than the Springbok brand. Hence, the Springboks want to do this deal because we are big in South Africa, but we don't have world appeal as the Springboks. We uh, don't have world, world appeal? appeal. No, the Springbok doesn't have world appeal. No, 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 Springbok has a world appeal. They have, definitely, Springbok, no, the polka has a world appeal. Definitely, that one is correct. The Springbok has a world appeal. You know, there's no other rugby team that has oh, won full World Cup. Compared to the All Blacks, we don't. Let's just be honest about it. I love the Springboks, but compared to the, to the, if you ask anybody, everybody knows the Haka. Everybody knows that. And that's what we are trying to achieve with the Springboks. You cannot sit here and tell me that the Springboks, uh, we play better than the All Blacks, but in world brand uh, commercial appeal, the All Blacks are bigger than the Springboks currently, and we are hope to change that. But here's the issue. I am agreeing with you that I think the Spring, the, the Saru could get more. I think that the deal needs to be relooked. But I'm also saying everybody that's complaining, put another deal on the table. You know, if there's only one buyer at the auction, mm. the, the price of that buyer will go. So my plea is not, my plea is for every billionaire in this country has complained about this deal. So I'm saying Saru is uh, near bankrupt, like all the other federations, uh, rugby unions around the world. Uh, most of them, 90% of them are facing financial distress. I'm saying... Put a better deal on the table. I have managed to postpone uh, this okay. uh, arrangement. So I'm, I'm challenging all the companies, all the business people that complain. I feel you. But put a deal on the table so that we can compare to something. All right. Um, I just want to move quickly to the arts as well in terms of what's been happening. You spoke about intervention at the School of Arts. Uh, but artists, of course, uh, themselves also uh, going through the most, uh, struggling uh, to keep head above water. And in that regard, you know, um, uh, talk to us about your interventions there and what is top of mind for you. I think the first thing is that, you know, artists in this country, it's an injustice and it's, an, it's a huge indictment that artists are not being seen as workers. You know, that's the first thing I hope to change together with my counterpart in the cabinet, that you cannot uh, have, uh, you cannot have uh, artists not being recognized as workers. And the second thing is with the Copyright Amendment Bill. Uh, we told the president uh, just to wait a bit before he signs because you cannot have things like fair use. How do you have fair use of somebody's work? We need to get those clauses out. I think those clauses were sneaked in there by the people that have been exploiting artists to say fair use for the work of the artist. Because once you say fair use, you say if you go and buy a burger and you must the fair amount, you must pay the fair amount. No, you must set your price as an artist. And then what we want to do, you know, the uncomfortable truth about South Africa and it's our nightlife and our entertainment life has really died. And then it's in a coma, it's in ICU. And we need to rescue that. We need to make sure we bring back the good times in South Africa. We need to bring back concerts. Our people are hungry for concerts. Hence, they have got Chris Brown selling out two stadiums, uh, two, uh, two nights in one stadium, mm. a 90,000 seater. Because but what about a, but what about our theatres, Minister? Because they are struggling. I'm coming they, to that one. They're struggling. I'm coming to that one. I went to go sign the, you know, the UAE is really leading when it comes to the arts currently. They've taken a bold decision. They've built buildings for the arts, new museums. They've got the Museum of the Future in Dubai. They, they've really invested. And we went to go look at what are they doing and how are they doing it. And I came back from there realizing that our art, uh, all our museums are outdated. 
and museums are still steeped in 1964. You know, that's why it doesn't attract young people. Perfect. Really good. See, this is what leadership looks like when you're working. Changing the boards, uh, bringing new boards, boards that will come in with fresh ideas to make sure that our museums become uh, sexy for young people to, to visit, basically. You know, at the moment they see it as boring. It's not something, but when you go to things, things like the Museum of the Future, where they mix uh, the, 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 the art with tech, technology, and that's the direction that museums are taking around the world. Okay. They need to be more creative. So, yeah, we are serious about the museums. We, we, we are fast running out of time, Minister. I need to put two questions to you. Um, uh, firstly, um, the uh, spinning that you announced a few weeks ago. So uh, this particular issue, the question has been, uh, spinning has been there, but in terms of the board that has been appointed and also um, spinning as a sport, is that a formal, formal um, structure and how much has been paid to them as of yet? Well, firstly, you know, when you, when you, when you do development of something, everybody's interim. So the boards that have been put there is interim boards, because you have to start somewhere. Uh, it's interim boards, there's people with expertise. We've got lawyers there, we've got the, town, the chartered accountants there, we've got people that know the sport of spinning. So that's a temporary board that has been put there. We haven't given them one cent. We intend to give them okay. five million development funding, five million development funding, so that the sport mustn't become an elite sport. All only right. the people that can afford cars. Got together. you there. I've got 10 seconds, Minister. Uh, the Jocelyn Smith Foundation, have you paid over your salary to it? Has it been registered? You know, what I've done is that every month I pay my salary to a charity while they are busy with it. I didn't think it would take so long to register. I thought you just walk in, you raise the foundation. It doesn't work like that. But any journalist is welcome to come to me personally. I'll show them exactly what I've, which charities I have supported. All right. With my salary. Perfect. We'll leave it there. Obviously, we need so much more time with you, Minister Gaten McKenzie. So It would be so nice if all of you journalists will ask all the ANC uh, these question, tough questions that you've asked Gates and Mackenzie. If you were actually asking these questions, maybe some of them would actually be out there and working hard. That's all I would want to say about that. You know, that's a great interview anyway. So, but